Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Egal, for uh, your, the work you have been doing, and thank you for the organizers today. Um, I think the, uh, the topic for the symposium, school safety for whom, is bang on, because our schools must be places where everyone, staff, students, parents, and the community, feels welcome, safe, and respected. Uh, if we want to keep moving forward with public education working, uh, and we want our goals of increasing student achievement, closing the gaps between students who are struggling, and continuing to build confidence in the public education system, if we want those goals to succeed, the first piece is that the students who are involved have to feel safe. And we know that right now, that's not always the case. Um, the Safe Schools Action Team has done uh, a few reports already. Uh, our first report was looking at bullying prevention. The second one was looking at discipline problem, uh, policies in Ontario to move from zero tolerance discipline policies to progressive discipline policies. We've looked at issues like cyber bullying. Uh, but we do recognize that homophobia and sexual harassment is a serious issue in the schools. And Minister of Education Kathleen Wynne asked uh, the Safe Schools Action Team, which I chair, to come together again. And uh, our mandate this third time out was specifically to look at issues of student-to-student -student gender-based violence, homophobia, sexual harassment, and inappropriate sexual behavior in schools. Kathleen also asked us to look at barriers that students face in reporting issues and reporting requirements for school staff, and also a review of the school board police protocol. So uh, we produced this report, which is on the Ministry of Education website here in Ontario. Uh, obviously, it addresses a lot of topics. We presented it to the minister in December, and what I'm going to focus on now is specifically our findings around homophobia. I guess the summary would be to say that nothing in the, the EGAL report surprises me because what EGAL found, we found. Uh, not more in a, in a community consultation mode, but our findings were essentially the same. So that when we talked about homophobia in schools, it was student to student, it was teacher to student, student to teacher, teacher to teacher, community influence imposing uh, homophobic at, at, at attitudes from the other side. So all sorts of different directions. When we looked at the uh, LGBTQ victims of, of homophobia, uh, we heard a lot about homophobic slurs, we heard a lot about homophobic bullying, that could be verbal, physical, social, cyberbullying. Uh, we heard about the isolation that the LGBTQ student population felt. When we looked at impacts, we heard about LGBTQ students becoming disengaged from their student, from their schools. And we're here at a faculty of education. You all know that time on topic counts. And if kids dis disengage from school, their performance drops. So that you see that uh, in extreme cases, or maybe not extreme, maybe the problem is that it isn't extreme, it's all too normal. We see that, uh, kid, the, that LGBTQ kids who are being harassed uh, often avoid going to school, their attendance drops. In, in more extreme cases, they drop out and they don't just drop out of school. Sometimes they drop out of home. Sometimes they drop, literally, <laughs> drop out of community. We talked to kids who uh, felt so rejected by their home community that they ended up on the street here in Toronto looking for some sort of community support. Uh, we heard from the police that, that the LGBTQ kids have an it, that they can identify that they have an increased rate of suicide. So the impacts that we identified were extraordinarily severe. So this is something that we need to deal with. What did we hear about school climate? Well, what we heard, again, the same as Egal, was that often homophobic slurs and homophobic behavior is ignored. And what the kids ourselves themselves said to us 
is that when the homophobic behavior is ignored, if you ignore it, that's like permitting it. So the turning the, your head the other way, if you're a staff member, the kids read that as granting permission to behave in a homophobic way. What we also heard was that in many cases, staff felt as if they were afraid to get involved in intervening or in supporting the LGBTQ kids. Uh, staff talked about being afraid of the reaction they would get from other teachers, from administration, from parents, from the community, and it wasn't just uh, staff using that as excuse. We talked to one staff member who actually was a GSA mentor in a school who said, in the previous school I taught in, I would have been afraid to do this. This school is a different climate, I can do it. In my previous school, I would never have dreamed of being the mentor for a GSA. We also, though, uh, heard uh, some very positive things. We heard that when you uh, make a conscious effort to establish safe spaces, when GSAs are allowed to grow up in schools, uh, when things like the Triangle Program that we're going to hear from, that those initiatives matter. And in particular, it matters when the students are involved in the initiative so that students can offer support to, from the, uh, to each other. So uh, we heard a lot of very um, heart-wrenching stories. We also heard some really positive initiatives that we want to see spreading. Um, some of you may be aware that there is a piece of legislation, Bill 157, before the House right now. I gave you that long list of things we looked at. It is mainly uh, focused not on homophobia policy work. We'll follow on that late, later. But uh, the things that are in the act do actually relate to the topic today. First of all is mandatory reporting by everybody in the school when there are serious incidents in the school. But because what we found in many cases where kids who are being bullied for, for homophobic reasons or for other reasons, and it wasn't getting passed along to the principal. Well, if the principal doesn't know about it, they can't deal with it. In most cases, it gets passed along, but particularly in the case of homophobia and sexual harassment, it often doesn't. So reporting will be mandatory to the principal. Second, uh, we also heard that often parents aren't informed where they're all the parents of the victims aren't informed. So it's also going to be mandatory to inform the parent of the victim, except when the principal has grounds to believe that informing the parents of the victim could make the situation work, cause more harm. And it was actually the experience of the LGBTQ students that inf uh, helped to inform putting that exception in because we know that in a lot of cases, kids would say to the principal, don't tell my parents what happened to me because if my parents know what happened to me, that may be like outing me and I may get thrown out of my home. So there's a reason with the LGBTQ kids that helps inform the exception. The third thing, which is really important, is that there will be a requirement in law to intervene when negative things are happening in schools. And that will be specific. one of the specific things when we get around to policy will be that you need to intervene in homophobic slurs. So we get over this turning a blind eye. So uh, there's a number of things in this legislation which I think will start to help address it. We've got a lot more work to do in policy. Uh, but I would like to thank Agal for doing the survey work and attaching the numbers. Thank you.